Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this briefing uh, as part of Infrastructure Week. We've just come off Mother's Day, and we have Memorial Day coming up. Um, I think Infrastructure Week may be the last holiday available for which uh, there is no sales at Macy's yet. Uh, so, it's, it's, yeah. Um, but infrastructure is obviously uh, one of the ties that binds. Uh, it is the economic lifeline for most of our economies, whether it's local, county, state, or national. And so while the very mention of the subject infrastructure may be enough for eyes to glaze over, for the fact of the matter is, uh, this nation is at a critical time in deciding how it will both finance and sustain needed investments in infrastructure. I serve as the Executive Director of the Council of State Governments, or CSG, uh, and in this capacity, we work with state officials from all three branches of government. We're a regionally based organization with strong regional organizations housed in Atlanta, New York, Chicago, and Sacramento that interact with state leaders on these topics. And I can assure you that the ability to partner with the federal government and state and county officials to shape public policy regarding transportation is among the highest priorities at the state level. I also have the pleasure of serving as the uh, chair of something called the Big Seven. This is an organization that links the major state and local uh, official organizations, including the National Governors Association, uh, the National Conference of State Legislatures, the National Association of Counties, the National League of Cities, the United States Conference of Mayors, and the International City Managers Association. Today's briefing is convened by six of those seven organizations who are interested in conveying to you information about um, how important this long-term reauthorization of the Federal Service Transportation Program is. The Big Seven is committed to maintaining a strong federal, state, and local partnership and believes that state and local governments can't be seen as just another special interest. <coughs> We have to be seen as partners in the governing process, as owners of 97% of this nation's critical infrastructure. States, municipalities, and counties are the drivers of a partnership that determines how our economy will function and the infrastructure that will link of those economies, goods, and services to consumers. The nation's transportation infrastructure is at a critical juncture with the current extension of the Moving Ahead for Progress in the 21st Century Act, MAP 21, set to expire at the end of May, and the Highway Trust Fund approaching another fiscal cliff shortly thereafter. The Big Seven urges Congress to ensure the continued solvency of the Highway Trust Fund while committing to adopt a long-term agreement on service transportation funding as part of a multi-year reauthorization of MAP 21. And we're not here today to speculate on how Congress should pay for a reauthorization of MAP 21, but simply to affirm our coalition support for a long-term authorization, allowing states, counties, and municipalities the opportunity to plan for infrastructure improvements. This constant kicking the can down the road for short-term reauthorizations uh, undermines the abilities of states and municipalities to plan long-term, and it also puts at risk the sustainable levels of funding necessary to, to build these infrastructure investments. Roads, bridges, and transit are funded through a partnership among all levels of government in which the financial contributions of each level are deeply intertwined. State and local leaders can no longer operate under the uncertain environment, and our communities need these infrastructure investments now. One of the leading surveyors of infrastructure needs, the American Society of Civil Engineers, issues a report card every year on America's infrastructure. A comprehensive assessment of the nation's infrastructure across 16 different sectors results in a cumulative GPA for infrastructure of a D plus. Indeed, there are $3.6 trillion of total infrastructure investment needed by 2020 across all 16 of these sectors, giving a funding shortfall of $1.6 trillion based on current funding levels. And we know that the federal government has had to patch the funds that are available in order to to uh, maintain the solvency of the uh, Highway Trust Fund. Now, during today's program, we'll hear from three state and local leaders about their, their role in their state and community and how it plays out that partnership, how a commitment from each level of government is essential in supporting our transportation and infrastructure priorities. While many of our state and local leaders have stepped forward with innovative solutions to meet our surface transportation needs, 
We all agree that the federal government plays a critical role in ensuring that we have a viable system that facilitates interstate commerce and addresses the mobility needs of all Americans. Um, it wasn't long ago when the interconnectedness of the United States was significantly hampered by a lack of infrastructure. But during the Eisenhower administration and with the, the uh, innovations of an interstate highway system primarily sold to the states and America as a, as a defense network, it quickly became apparent to the states that infrastructure investments not only create jobs in building them, but also create connections that are essential to maintaining prosperity and the economic vitality of the states. We have three great leaders at each of the levels of state, county, and local government. They're here today to share their perspectives with all of you. Our first panelist will be Senator Mike Bailey. He's South Dakota's Senate Transportation Committee Chairman, and he also co-chairs CSG's Transportation Public Policy Committees, provides a unique perspective on the importance of maintaining consistent funding at the federal level. He'll be followed with comments today from the National Association of Counties uh, President, Maui, Hawaii County Council Member, Ricky Hokama, uh, who will share information about the roles, the, the critical role counties play in our nation's infrastructure systems. Um, we look forward to hearing from Council Member Hokama. And finally, we'll hear from Michael Wolchek, who is a councilman in Rochester, Minnesota. He was elected to the City Council there in 2009, and he chairs the National League of Cities Community and Economic Development Committee. These public officials, we appreciate their time here today, but their presence underscores the importance that they place on the priority of surface transportation and public transit that are funded through these vital partnerships. So I'm going to turn it over first to uh, our Senate Chair, um, and to have him offer a few remarks, we'll just go down the line to hear from each of these individuals, and then we want to have an opportunity for a dialogue in which you'll have an opportunity to ask questions uh, and delve deeper into the perspectives that these uh, three individuals bring to the table today. So thank you all for being here, for your shared interest in this topic, for hearing from state, county, and local officials on this topic, and we'll turn it over now to the center. So. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, you know, the first thing I want to say is when I walked in, I, I, I saw Justin, who's with CSG, and he had his arm in a sling. He reminded me that I went to the doctor the other day, and uh, I have a problem with a rotator cuff. And you see how they've all got to wear those slings. And he says, how, how, did, you, how did you do this? What, what, what did you do to you know, screw this up? I says, are you kidding? I just come from the legislative session. Three months, they just twisted my arm completely off. <laughs> I'm going to talk about roads today. How many of you here uh, like roads with potholes in them and wobbly bridges? How many people like those? Huh? No, not, not very many. How many like to pay for good roads and bridges? How many like to pay for good roads and bridges? Eh, there's a few of you. Uh -huh. That's our problem, okay? Everybody wants good roads and bridges. Nobody wants to pay for them. I, I, I think Dave should have to pay, or I think Ricky should have to pay, or Michael should have to pay. Someone should have to pay. I shouldn't be me. Okay? Okay. As he said, I'm chair of the Senate Transportation Committee. I was fortunate this year. We passed a comprehensive bill, probably the most comprehensive bill uh, in the last 30 years. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be prime sponsor of that bill. Uh, I say now, fortunate, uh, going through the session. It was not. It was the first bill introduced, Senate Bill 1. And except for the budget bill, which has got to go last, it was the last bill considered at 6 o'clock the night that we adjourned. Okay? So, People say, well, did you really talk about this? Uh, was, it, um, did, was it out there to be discussed? Yeah, it was. Uh, why was that a problem maybe for me? Number one, I'm a Republican, okay? We're in a time where people do not like taxes or tax increases. And South Dakota is, for, for states, it has the lowest tax burden for state and local taxes of any state in the nation, okay? We are the lowest for taxes in the nation, state and local taxes. So this is not an easy job, okay? My friend says, you're dumb in a box of rocks, Valley. This is an election year. You're gonna get you're just gonna get creamed. Well, my opponent dropped out in August, okay? And I started a year ago today and I was I was out talking this. Um, have we got the slides up here? Okay. That's not mine. There we go. Okay. Um, this is the second slide, and I'm, I'm going to tell you some of the things that, um, that why I think we were successful. The first thing that we did was 
I asked to have a task force to study this during the summer. Our legislative session goes January, February, March. Now I want to have a, a study all through the summer to do that. I got a bipartisan task force. In fact, I got it to be the number one issue that people ask to have studied in the legislature. And then what I did is once I did that, they made me chairman. I said, we're going to take this thing around the state. We went to seven different communities all the way around the state and, and, and brought in people to testify. <coughs> and I had a sign up here and it said, there's a, a counting chart that said problems, solutions. So I said, when you come up here to testify, you can talk to us about your problems. But I said, then tell us what you think would be a good solution that's fair to everyone. And you could just see people kind of squirming out there, like, Baron, I'm just going to tell you what a problem is. I ain't going to tell you something that's fair. You, just, you guys got to find the money, you know? Then what we did is we got an alliance of different interest groups. And, and, and the ones that started it, obviously, were the construction people. I said, you can't have that because you have an interest in it to have more roads. So we got everything from chambers of commerce to uh, ag groups to car, uh, the Automobilers Association. Got the, we had tw over 25 different groups that were saying, we need to do something with our roads. Next thing I did is, I went to the governor again. Four years ago, he had told me, no. And, I, and he, he, was, he, he, he made a no tax pledge. He says, unless it's an emergency. And I went through 45 slides with him, and he, he says, I understand the need, but he says, I just can't do that. You haven't shown me it's an emergency today. I said, please don't do that in four years when you run for re-election. Please don't. And every year, then we'd have meetings together, and I'd, I'd walk out, and I'd say, Governor, don't be making that pledge again, especially on roads. And he didn't. In fact, when the primary came up, he says, I just want you all to know that I'm ready to do something for roads. So if you're, and he says, I just want you to want that on the plate. I said, no new taxes last time, but, so that helped. So that got the Department of Transportation with me. Then when I did all my talking, when I was before every legislative committee, that I, I'm chair of a committee, but after that, when I went to others, I had three books that I sat in front of me. The first one was about so deep, and it had every road, every mile of road in the state. And it said everything on there that, 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 that you'd want. I mean, it had everything from the joint spalling, the corner cracking, the transverse cracking, the fatigue cracking, the roughness index, the last year approved accidents year, but 65 different line item things that you could take a look at and say, here's the condition of our roads. Then the next thing I had was the bridges. Every bridge in this nation has got, to, over 20 feet, has got to be inspected every two years. Federal law. So I had that. So I says, any of you want to come look at your bridges in your district? Here it is. I got it right here. I got this pile. And then I had, remember I said I took this around state? I had uh, a, a stack of documents from all that testimony. We had probably all over 100 people probably went to each one, but we, actual people that testified probably had 125 different people. So you can imagine 125 people coming up with testimony coming uh, before a committee. R really went well. Then I said, you have to be willing to go into the lion's den. And I did. I went to the farm groups. I told them what we were looking at. I went to the Petroleum Marketers Association, raising the gas tax. They were not real happy, but they understood where we were at. Next slide. The last one there, I do want to say one other thing because I'll come back to it. When, you, when you're in the process of negotiating this, be flexible. Remember what your end goal is. You want to get to whatever it is, but be flexible in the middle. I'm, I got plenty of slides here that I can tell you what we needed to do as evidence because I think that's what you need to do. You need to show the need. Here's what I did with ours, uh, one, just one of the slides. The last time we raised our gas tax was in 1999. Fed's the last time they did it in 93. Okay, so we raised ours in 99, we raised it to 22 cents, hadn't done it since. That 22 cents today, if you, if you follow the cost of building a road, that would be 45 cents. And then I'd always tell people, don't worry, I'm not trying to take it to 45 cents. All right, but I said, that's where it would be if we'd followed inflation. Next slide. If I was to have one slide to show you, this would probably be it. And it's kind of hard to see from, from, from that angle, but this is one of the things you're up against. Right now in our state, only 2% of the roads are in poor condition. Our state roads, not our county and township, 2%. And what's in fair is only 9%. That's pretty good. In fact, that's excellent. That's terrific. So I said to the Department of Transportation, I said, what's that going to be in 10 years at the same federal funding and the same state funding? We go from 2% poor to 25% poor. And we go from 9% fair to 27%. So we go from 11% poor and fair 
to over 50% of our roads. I says, we have $55 billion worth of commerce that goes on our road each year. Our number one and two industries are agriculture and tourism. What do they do with poor roads? No one's going to come visit. And we are going to get our corn, beans, and wheat out of here. Next slide. But you have to present the need and you have to say, where are we going? I have to be someone that's big on performance indicators, dashboards. So I says, okay, what's going to be our goal here? So we sat down with the Department of Transportation, we worked out something. We came up with something that was, it's kind of hard to read from here, but it looks like it's 5% poor and 15% fair, about 50% good and 30-some percent excellent. That's a condition that is in worse shape than what our roads are today. So I said, we aren't looking to, 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 to get them even as good as we are today. But in 10 years, that's where we need to be. And then in the law, what we did is, I made it mandatory that the Department of Transportation had to come before each transportation committee each year and say, here's where we're at today, and here's where you're going to be in 10 years, and here's where your goal was. And if we weren't there, how much is it going to cost? Then it's up to the legislature to decide what do they want to do. So it was goal-oriented. We had a goal. We established the need. Then we set a goal. And we said, how much is this going to cost us? Well, we all looked at that and went, oh, boy. So that's what we did. We divided it out. Did we get everything we wanted? No. No, we didn't. Um, but we at least got to start. And now every year, because I'm going to be turned out, every year, still going to have to come up and say, here's where we're at, and here's what it's going to be. Now, the press is going to be there, and they can all say, well, we decided to do nothing. All right. But at least we know. It doesn't come up and clip you on the back of the head like a hammer. Okay? And that's kind of what happened to us this time. All right, let's go to the locals. I don't know if you can see that top bridge up there. Bridge, look, let's face it. Roads and bridges aren't sexy. You don't have any heartstrings that I can go and pull on that heartstring and say, you know, if you don't give me this money, the more people are going to die from cancer or AIDS or whatever. There's no heartstrings out there. Okay? Here's one. That, that bridge up there, the last vehicle over that bridge, was a school bus. Now, it made it across. What happened was, short story, mom comes down, puts her kid on the bus, the bus takes off, goes across the bridge, and she's watching it go across that bridge. She says, oh, that, that doesn't look good. So she calls up her county commissioner and says, this bridge doesn't look good by my place. So he comes bebopping out there. He looks at the bridge, and he's out there looking at it. Here comes a semi, 18 we were pulling the pop. Load of grain. He goes over and says, hey, you can't go here. Sorry, sorry, this bridge doesn't look good. You, you're not going. You ever try, try to back up an 18 wheel with a pump behind it? You can imagine how that conversation deteriorated real quick. But he got him to back up. So now he's going to go back to his vehicle. As he's walking back to his vehicle on the other side, bridge fails. Now he caught a lot of grief from his fellow commissioners that he's a little overweight. He's a little overweight. <laughs> But that's the only one that I have. And I have used that picture just about in every presentation I've made, because that's the only heartstrings one I've got for, for transportation. And you can look at the other slides, you know. There's a, I look at that, and my, my uh, comment on that one was, uh, he called home and he says, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, the, the cedar is still on land, but the four-wheel tractor is uh, in the crib. So, next slide. You can't read that, so I'll go through it real quick. People said to me, you raised your, your gas tax South Dakota, didn't you? I said, oh, well, yeah. And, and that's all you did, right? He says, no. No, that's not all we did. We spread it out. And that's one thing that I would say to people is spread the pain out so that not everyone feels it. Here's what we did. And I'll go through them real quick. We raised the gas tax six cents, which was a 27% increase. We raised the, the car uh, tax when you buy a car by 33%. We raised the license plates by 20%. We raised the egg plates over anything that carries over more than 10 ton, 33%. You think that wasn't popular? Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we went to the counties and the locals for those bridges we were talking about, and we said, we're going to set up a bridge fund. And in order to get into that money from that bridge fund, you have to have a wheel tax, so you got some skin in the game. And two, you have to have a road and bridge program. We found out there that counties and towns didn't, didn't have a program. Some of them, it was basically you make sure that the county commissioner's road looked pretty good, okay? Then what we did is we have a property tax freeze in the state of South Dakota. And that property tax freeze, um, you, people get to vote if you want to go outside that property freeze amount. What we said was we set up another mechanism that they could do that it didn't come before a vote of the people. They could, they could petition to bring it before a vote, but it didn't automatically. 
And then, like I said, you've got to be prepared to be flexible. Well, in that process, we raised the speed limit by 5 mile an hour on the interstate to 80 mile an hour. Okay? Now, everybody says, the people came up to me and says, why did you let that happen? I'm sitting there looking. I'm going pretty good. I've got this thing through four committees now, and I'm sitting there at the last one, and, and somebody has that amendment. No one's speaking against it. I'm saying, and I'm up there talking against or for each amendment, and I looked at that one, I looked at the chair, and I just smiled. I just sat in my seat. For five mile an hour, was I going to ditch this thing where I lost this thing seven years ago by three votes? Mm -mm. No, I just sat in my chair. Um, <laughs> fact is, in South Dakota, if you wanted to drive 80 before this happened, you didn't get picked up. All right. So I thought, you know, <laughs> why, am, why am I going to derail a train that everybody's doing it that wants to do it anyway? You know what was the interesting part of this? When I got home, I've had one person one person that is talking to me about what we did with the gas tax and all the other taxes. You know what they're on me about? How'd you raise that uh, speed limit to 80 mile an hour? I can't believe you did that. Best diversion ever had, and I was, I, 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 that's not what I was going to have. All right, I'm going to finish up here. The states are doing that part. Five states did it this year. In the last two years before that, we had eight states that have done something. Now, and I'm talking to the, the folks here in this room, a lot of you are staff members. I was a staff member. I was here on, as a staff member as legislative aide for, in, in the early 70s. And that really dates me. And the important part is those members and, and senators, they have faith in you. They have confidence in you. Otherwise, you wouldn't be working for them. And they believe in what you say. So I'm asking you to try and make this into a vision of what we, where we need to go. Think of it this way. How would you like to be any one of the 50 state secretaries of transportation? And you've got to make a long-range plan. And you don't know, when you put out these contracts, you get put out these bids to build bridges and roads, you don't know in the next four months if your 80% partner is going to be there or not. How would you like to let out those bids? Because, see, we, the states pay for that, and then we send a bill to the federal government for their 80% share. We front the money. How would you like to be doing that every, every cycle? Well, in four months, do you think, uh, think they're going to you know, extend this again or, or not? What do, you, what do you think? That's a tough duty for all our states. So I'm, I'm saying somehow we've got to muster up the intestinal fortitude to take this on. And it's not an election issue. If you tell and show the need like we did in South Dakota, like I said, the guy is running against me, he dropped out in August. And I've been headlining every paper. Now I'm trying to raise the gas tax again. And then I have I, I, one, one other comment. How much do you think you pay in uh, gas taxes per household? How many, how, how, what do people think? 100? Some people say 1,000, 2,000. The average household pays $46 in gas tax per month. Electricity and gas, the average is 160. Cell phones, 160. And cable and internet are 124. Where are our priorities? <laughs> okay, and that's why I'm going to finish with, this is a slide that I finished every one of my presentations. Next slide. If you got it, a road brought it. There's not much parachuted in. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I will say that we are uh, we're very pleased to uh, have parachuted in with us today at this uh, hearing, a very special guest. We want to give her a chance to uh, address all of you as well. Uh, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton uh, is in her 13th term uh, representing the District of Columbia. She's a ranking member on the House Subcommittee on Highways and Transit within the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. She's been a leader in calling for improvements in our nation's infrastructure and working to find a solution for the reauthorization of the Surface Transportation Bill. We certainly want to thank her for our leadership and for being here. We call on Congresswoman Norton to say a few words, please. That's where the detail is. Uh, and here in the Congress, I have to be absolutely candid, is where the detail is not. So I'm going to be making a very special plea. I'm not going to talk about progress because it's been done. I'm going to talk about amping up 
the extraordinary things you've been doing so that maybe we can get some progress. I very much appreciate the League of Cities, the Big Seven, uh, all of you for your own work. But we really got to take into account what the Congress has become. And even, frankly, emergencies don't get acted upon unless somebody ramps it up. I mean, we were down to the last minute, and the Homeland Security appropriation had been saved, uh, trying to, to force something on immigration out of the administration. Everybody knew that the administration was going to run. So what got the Homeland Security appropriation? This is the security of the United States passed. And we just ran out of time. And you know, they, they, they couldn't go on anymore. So even an emergency won't do it. So I'm really trying to put in context what we're dealing with here. But I, I must say at the same time that our committee is very bipartisan. Uh, Chairman Schuster, uh, uh, ranking member DeFazio, is the ranking member of the full committee, uh, are working closely together. So this is uh, a leadership call, really. Uh, and it's a call on the money. Our, 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 I almost said Bill, our, our subcommittee and our committee don't have to do <coughs> with uh, the money. But you know, that has never been something I must tell you, and I've been on this committee ever since I've been in Congress, that we even worried about. We had to worry about reauthorizing the bill, and they knew you come up with the money. Of course, that money was a whole lot easier to come up with because it was the Highway Trust Fund. Um, I just come off the floor um, but because I am trying my best to, to amp it up here, uh, so-called one minute, and, and I think we passed out what I used as a poster. Um, I went to uh, one of our main bridges yesterday, and the press was with me. And a major story appeared this morning in the Washington Post. And Milton used this bridge to make a point. Now, the interesting thing is I wasn't making a point uh, necessarily about the bridge. There were plenty of points to be made about the bridge. Actually, the concrete bridge is not as bad off as some other bridges. I was making a point, uh, the point I tried to make on the House floor about how failure to overhaul this bridge meant that billions of dollars in economic development could not proceed in the District of Columbia. Uh, for example, in order to make room for high-speed rail. That doesn't have to do with the service transportation bill. But they have got to dig a whole new kind of union state uh, to do that. Um, Above Union Station, just to get to how the, the economic development ramps up, is to be a whole new community over the tracks. Nobody can think of dates and money and funding about how to proceed as long as that bridge, which will take five years uh, to finish, is held up. So one thing I urge you to do is to link roads and bridges to other economic development. Uh, believe me, everybody here, except those on our committee, see a road and bridge that go over every day. It's still up, isn't it? <laughs> Structurally deficient, deficient, so what? It's still running. This is a place that does not want to spend money, that believes uh, that you can build roads and bridges without spending money. So I, I really want to, to indicate that the ordinary kind of lobbying and, and uh, calling the alarm simply has not worked. We are exactly where we were last July in the last reauthorization. Somebody needs to tell you all the truth. Exactly where we are. No new thinking. No new pressure. No feeling of alarm in this house. There is some greater sense that we ought to be moving in the Senate, uh, not enough there either. So one of the things we're doing, I want to talk about this project, 
which I made into a poster. Again, in order to put a face on infrastructure, you know, those are just words that don't make it out there to, to Mahari and Joe. You know, we've got to make it mean something. And so the face I put on it was a major bridge over which, I mean, if you live in the nation's capital, you go over that bridge. You go, go over on the way to major roads. All of the inner city buses from all over the United States come in there. Our streetcars going to come up there. Um, to, to kind of drive home others to help me drive this house. We also, uh, I've asked the members of my subcommittee to go down uh, each day with a poster that we have had drawn up, saying <laughs> the number of days, legislative days. You know, today it says six days. You know, that'll be crossed out and tomorrow it'll say five days. Uh, for the exploration of the service transportation program. Now, the reason we're doing silly little things like this <laughs> is because without that kind of constant pressure on, on this house, nothing even remotely uh, begins to get done. So when people really want to get something done, they get a group around them to rally the members. So it becomes visible back home. You might think roads and bridges are visible. They are invisible in this house because nobody here feels that anybody back home thinks that it, it, it matters that much. This is not a house that wants to do a lot of legislation anyway. Uh, even the most bipartisan legislation you could have, and I must tell you nothing could be no, more bipartisan than what we're working on now. Look at the construction season. What construction season? <laughs> Uh, it's so gone that, for example, many of the unions say we ought to just let it go until July and press for a, um, a, a long-term bill. Because they could not start a major project like the one I just talked about now anyway. They've got to have some certainty that if you're going to start on a five-year project, we're talking major economic development projects, that's what people want to do. Uh, you're just not going to start it unless you're irresponsible on a, even a one-year uh, reauthorization. Um, um, this deadline was set last July. So don't think that, oops, another one has caught us. Uh, <laughs> you know, you set a whole year. Um, and now, the reasons I can't tell you, we set May 31st, and it looks like People are talking about July again. Um, watch out for the habit, and that's what I mean on the floor. You're getting a habit. And as long as the Congress believes that this habit satisfies the immediate need, they are going to give you six-month patches. Um, for all of your own work, the big seven, in keeping this front and, 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 and center, we just welcome the council in thinking about ways to amp up uh, the pressure. Because I cannot tell you, well, I'll tell you, we've got people in the committee. I've got Helena here, she would tell you. This is a very bipartisan committee. We don't have people in the committee talking about, well, suppose we did this, or, or suppose we did that. Uh, we weren't even able, for example, I don't know where I would stand on BMT, so one of the things I would like to have seen in the last reauthorization is a pilot audit. And besides, there's some states doing it. I'm going to put in a bill, or I'm going to try to get in the bill at least, to have the states uh, somehow uh, um, work together to, to, to make the Congress understand what it means because there are different states and there are different versions of it. But what do you think the Congress, without any sense of what to do, would want to take advantage of at least something that, that is being done? Uh, no raw thinking, no thinking even so far outside the box that it couldn't happen. Even that would help because it gets you back to something that perhaps could be done. Um, understand that we're talking about a reauthorization bill that already doesn't give a fair share to the states and localities. You're asking for crumbs. If you get anything, it's going to be level funding. 
So if here I'm begging for help just to get that, I think it says something about the crisis we are in. Um, if there is no certainty, what people have to know back home is that there are no roads and bridges. And they really have to know it's not just the road you go over every day, but they have to be in touch with what other economic development is not, it, it is not happening. Now I asked my staff to find out about this growing movement. I'm so grateful for it. I think you heard just one example of it to raise the gas tax. Um, just because people, the states are so desperate that, that, that they just need some money and it's, they're just recovering from the recession. So if they need some, they just dig into what they've got. So here, here we have 10, Iowa, Wyoming, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Virginia, Vermont, District of Columbia. These, these are states that have gas tax increases or reforms going on. Those states have nothing in common <laughs> except the need for transportation funding. States that are making progress uh, in this direction, six of them, Georgia, Mich Michigan, North Carolina, South Dakota, Utah, Washington State, again, the usual mix of states. Then there are states that are considering changes. Idaho, Kentucky, Missouri, Nebraska, New Jersey, South Carolina, Vermont. There are some up here who say, well, you know, let's, let's, let's let this go on. Then it will have to devolve to the states. Well, that's not what's happening. The states still want our share to come to them. They're not saying we'll take over transportation funding. Uh, so we don't think anybody is seriously considering that, but there are members here who are for devolution. And I really do thank those who came to testify before one of our committees. Uh, there were governors, state DOTs, people from cities, regional councils. They were, they were red and blue. And every last one of them poo pooed the whole notion of devolution. So there can be no doubt that that is not a serious uh, uh, issue here. Uh, the president is, must be concerned because of the Grow America Act with the fact that we are now ranked 25th in the world in infrastructure quality. That's very bad. Everybody is catching up. Transportation has been a key to the growth of our economy. That has been lost up here because money is what you don't want to get into. The ranking member, uh, DeFazio, has, has asked uh, uh, Chairman Ryan for a joint hearing of our committee and ways and means. And Mr. Ryan has not said yes, but he's the earliest he would even consider it as June. <laughs> Notice that's after May 31st. <laughs> uh, not that we could get a, 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 a tax bill through in this time anyway, but you would think there would be somebody roaring, uh, 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 roaring to try to get us to, to the finish line. So I, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Besides the, the several things I'm doing, I'm having a round table. With every member, I've asked members to bring, uh, if, you, if you don't have a picture, like the picture that I was able to get in the Washington Post, I've asked each member for opening remarks to make a, to, to use one project in, in, in his or her district, which is, is stalled because of no funding here. Again, we're trying to make it real rather than something called service transportation infrastructure. We're trying to bring it down to the level where members will have to pay attention to it. I am um, introducing, uh, at the request of the administration, the Grow America Act. Uh, that, of course, is for much more than we could ever get. But we do have to have a marker out there. I think that's a bill we all, we all would support for $78 million. And of course, it takes advantage of the untaxed foreign earnings. Uh, my, so my closing message to you is uh, if, as the rumor is, and by the way, we don't, don't think because we're members of Congress, we know what's going to happen. If we, were in the, if we were in the majority, we wouldn't be able to tell you any more than I'm telling you now. Because there is no daylight between the majority and the minority on this bill. So we need your most creative thinking and your most creative work back home. Uh, because 
July is, is almost certain. Would you like another July? Remember where we're going. We're going into 2016. Uh, so one wonders uh, what will happen if this goes over into another presidential year, where a whole lot of us will make a lot of hay with it. Meanwhile, the projects will be stalled. Help us. <laughs> Help! <laughs> Thank you very much. And now we'll uh, turn to uh, Council Member Pokemon. and I'm from Maui County, Hawaii, and I have the pleasure. Thank you, David. And I have the pleasure of uh, serving as the president of the National Association of Counties. So today I have 3,069 county stories to tell you. <laughs> but, uh, and Congressman, thank you for being here. We appreciate your presence. By the numbers, counties own 45% of the nation's roads. 40% of the nation's bridges, 30% of the nation's transit systems and airports. Counties also own a wide variety of public infrastructure assets. Many of us have public buildings, water systems, wastewater systems, stormwater systems. On an annual basis, our counties invest over $100 billion in building infrastructure and maintaining and operating public works. So as owners, investors, and managers, and a partner with our state and federal uh, friends, we own a significant portion of the nation's infrastructure, and counties know firsthand the cost of underinvestment and inaction at the federal level. Investing in a 21st century American infrastructure is important to counties and the communities we as elected officials serve. And that is one of the main reasons why I have made transportation and infrastructure the focus of my presidential initiative. Now, whether it be moving goods to and from our harbors and ports, definitely we're talking about people <coughs> places like Hawaii, we're connecting people to the services we provide. Counties are dependent on transportation infrastructure. Modern and efficient infrastructure can bolster opportunities for our Main Street businesses, manufacturers, our farmers. Unfortunately, for too long, we as a nation have underinvested in our infrastructure. And while counties have been doing our part to raise revenue locally, issuing bonds and attract private investment, we cannot do it alone. We need our partners to be hand in hand. And I can say, there's no place down the road to kick the can anymore. The can's in the pothole. Okay. It needs to be fixed. And that is why we are here on the Hill today asking Congress to fix the Highway Trust Fund, pass a long-term reauthorization of MAP 21. We all know that the cost of construction is increasing at a rate that exceeds inflation. And counties cannot afford, states cannot afford, cities cannot afford, the American public can afford for Congress to keep reading. In addition to local state and federal funding, county utilizes the municipal bonds to deliver critical transportation infrastructure projects. For over a century, the tax exemption of municipal bond interest has provided counties, state, and other local governments with a low cost, again I say, low cost financing mechanism to invest in our counties or excuse me, our country's infrastructure. Our research shows that from 2003 to 2013, that investment in infrastructure amounted to approximately $4.2 trillion, trillion dollars, through long-term tax exempt municipal bonds. We consider that a significant amount when compared to the $1.43 trillion provided by the federal government. Now, over the past several years, we have seen numerous proposals that seek to change the tax exemption for the interest earned on municipal bonds. 
the proposals range from outright elimination to limiting the benefit of the exemption. NACO believes that any change to the tax exemption for municipal bonds, which has been in place since the first written tax code in 1913, would result in increased cost to counties to get these vital projects done. Costs that would ultimately be shifted to the local taxpayer and result either in decreased infrastructure investment or no projects to move forward. That is why we continue to ask Congress as our partner to please protect the tax exemption for municipal bond interest. Thank you very much for your attention. to get here. 
those of you that may have um, spontaneously formed on the spot here, my apologies to you, but for everybody else, we understand that transportation is how we get places. Let's jump to the next slide. Um, that, little, that little black dot you see in the uh, center, that's our downtown area right there. And those big arrows are actually the number of people coming from different, um, different quadrants to come into our downtown. Uh, we're going to be growing by about 50,000 jobs in the core of our community over the next generation. A lot of them, uh, you know, good medical jobs, a lot of research, technology, engineering type jobs. And um, our community, we have more jobs in our community than we have people in our community. So we absolutely have to be connected. And right now our tools for, um, for getting this done are, are in jeopardy right now. We don't have the long-term stability needed from a transportation plan that's going to give us the assurances that we can plan for our infrastructure. Nor do we, we're also one of the greatest tools we have is tax exempt municipal bonds. Um, we've done a lot of amazing projects in our community that maybe would not have been funded. Somebody said earlier that, you know, roads and bridges aren't sexy, I mean. In the world where we're building sewer pipes and wastewater treatment plants, actually, roads and bridges are kind of sexy compared to that. <laughs> so it's all, it's all relative, but these are, these are critical to, um, these are the most basic services that we provide our communities. Let's jump to the next slide. Um, even in the city of Rochester, we're a city of 120,000, but we realize we cannot do business as usual. We cannot build enough lanes. We cannot build enough parking spots to make our city successful. As such, we need to plan for transit improvements. This is um, a plan that we've recently put together, um, focusing on our medical interests in the downtown. And we realize that we're going to need some sort of fixed route transportation. If we're going to be as successful as a community, if we're going to grow, like we're talking about growing, we need to do something that moves more people more efficiently. In order to do that, we need the certainty that comes with a long-range transportation plan. We need to know that if we're going to invest in the studies, the research, the planning, and the development that goes along with this, the dollars have to be there to do the projects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Conversely, we could try and drive more people to downtown Rochester. And the interesting thing here is um, downtown is somewhere underneath that uh, orange square right there. And that orange square represents the number of uh, new surface parking spots that we would need if we were going to drive everybody downtown. The problem there is it's bigger than our downtown itself. So clearly, that's not going to work for us. Uh, conversely, we could take eight full city blocks in our downtown core and build parking structures that are eight or nine stories tall, and we could park enough vehicles. Or we could simply take one of our existing uh, uh, parking blocks and make it 101 stories tall, which would also solve the problem, but perhaps there might be some additional challenges that came along with that. As such, we understand that different forms of transit are critical to the future of our community. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also understand preferences are changing. Um, I have a lot of friends who really don't want to own an automobile. They want to pick a community where they have um, their, their limited dollars can grow into other resources. Uh, the, the chart that's right there on the right side is from the uh, U.S. Department of Transportation in terms of millennial changes in millennial preferences. Um, and you can see that driving is actually um, going down in millennial preferences and other forms, you know, bicycling, um, pu uh, public transit, walking are, have gone up. On the other side, on the left side is actually, and it's difficult to see in here, but it's the most share of our community, where we are today on the top, and that um, the large orange one is your single, um, single occupant vehicle trips. And you can see for us, just to get the workforce into our downtown, between now and 2035, that has to shift substantially. We need far no more people taking transit, biking, and walking into our community. And yes, it is actually physically possible to walk and bike in Minnesota in the winter. I assure you it's the truth. I've done it myself. You warm up after a little bit. Um, <laughs> next, next slide, please. <laughs> um, part, part, part of this is um, when we talk about funding solutions, we're talking about different modes of transportation. It's important that we have the flexibility to do what's right for our community. We understand that um, people aren't going to bicycle and walk downtown even if they uh, live close by. If they don't have safe routes to do so. So part of our planning is we want to make sure that whether you're taking public transportation, whether you're bicycling, walking, or driving an automobile, it's safe and it's effective for you. I've learned in my limited time in office that if you have 95% a safe route to get somewhere and 5% isn't safe, nobody wants to do that. You really have to close the gaps. This is um, how we're going to get uh, pedestrians and bicyclists through our downtown by creating a, um, a master planned area where it's very safe and friendly year round for people to use that. Um, next slide, please. Um, that's, that's what I want to tell you a little bit about Rochester, but to emphasize this, without communities having the ability to do planning, we're not saving anybody money 
by not investing in transportation. We're actually costing communities a lot of money. We're costing them opportunities. We're costing them great jobs. If we don't have the stability and um, knowledge that the dollars are going to be there when we need to do the projects, we're going to lose out on a lot of economic development. So you know, on behalf of America's communities, and everyone is different, we're asking again for a long-term solution that gives us some level of certainty and protect our abilities to do great things. Thank you. Well, we want to uh, make a turn and give you all the opportunity to ask questions or engage in this dialogue. I know we have some senior staffers that uh, deal with infrastructure needs all the time here in the Congress, and we certainly would encourage them to offer their expertise in responding to questions or in uh, illuminating the uh, discussion we've had so far. But I promised our panelists that I'd give them a first take at uh, reflecting on what others had said during the course of the discussion, that there was anything they wanted to do to, uh, to uh, reiterate a point that was made by someone else or underscore uh, the direction of the dialogue uh, in what they heard here today. I'll take first crack at it. Out of the four of us that you heard speak, and also the Congresswoman speak, Two things for a common thread. Two things. One, a long-term transportation policy and a certainty of funding. Without that, it's difficult whether you're a state, you're a county, or you're a municipality. It just makes it difficult. Like I said, just picture yourself as that secretary of transportation and not knowing what your 80% partner is going to do. I think that probably was the common thread amongst us. I just wanted to reiterate that. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for me, from the county's perspective, I would say that during the Congress I'm in here, my, my partners, my peers, whether it be the senator or the city councilman, the sense of urgency, I think we all, we all get it. I think the question is, for me, is why isn't Congress getting that sense of urgency? Americans feel it. On a day-to-day basis, without in the road, they fill it in their pocket list because it takes more to maintain their vehicle. Whether it be simple repairs, flat tires, or they need to buy more gas because it's a longer route to go around the short route that this food happens. So for me, that's what I'm getting out of this conversation is why can't we convince Congress that our sense of urgency is real and it needs to be acted upon? No. Thank you. I, I took heart the comments that uh, um, Congresswoman Norton said as well that we need to have this communication back and forth. And I think that every member of Congress could go back to their district and talk with community leaders within their district and actually physically go see a location where the transportation bill is going to have an effect. This is not something that certain parts of the country will benefit and not others. That's why you have such diverse support for this. But what you really need to do is understand where those projects are, what they mean to the community, and realize that whatever we're talking about, the challenges that we face, there's going to be a lot more positive that comes out from those ribbon cuttings for the spectacular new things that are coming in your communities. And I think the message has to be from us, too, is that you know, we, we have your back on this. You know, every community in America is struggling from these issues, and we really need some certain solutions done. Well, uh, are there questions, comments, uh, anything else uh, that you might want to add to the conversation? Um, thank you, the panelists. I'm actually here in D.C. for Transportation Week. My name is Josh Burns, and I'm the uh, chair of the uh, Transportation Committee of the Iowa House, so I'm a legislator from Iowa. Um, we heard the congressman talk about we did pass fuel tax in Iowa, 10 cent fuel tax this session. Um, I'm a Republican, that's never popular. Um, but I will tell you that I don't know who my audience is here, I don't know who you're representing today, um, but I will tell you that it needs to be done. And we have to quit worrying about elections. We have to quit worrying about getting reelected and doing certain things just because we're worried about are we going to be back in that position again. I mean, if you're doing a good job, voters are going to put you back. Um, I've been an advocate for increasing the fuel tax for the last three years. It's taken me that long to get the fuel tax done in Iowa. It took three years. And my last campaign, this last November, um, I won with 62% of the vote. My constituents knew where I stood on that. 
And that's what they wanted. And I think most Americans do. And I think that, you know, as I'm on here this week listening to people and talking to people, the level of frustration with the inability to get things done out here, I mean, quite frankly, it's embarrassing. And, and I just think that, you know, hopefully you can take those messages back to the people that you represent and say, you know what, Americans are frustrated. Infrastructure is a key component to economic development in this country. Um, I come from an agricultural area. I, I have places where we're selling farmland for $19,000 an acre. And it's important that we get that crop out of the field to market. And one thing that separates us from Brazil, and that's our competition right now, their infrastructure is horrible but they're building it faster than we are. And I hate for us to someday look back on that and say, you know what, we should have been building our infrastructure because we let Brazil surpass us because they're getting their crops out. They're getting things done. I, I just think as the greatest nation in the world, why would we ignore our infrastructure? I, I just think it needs to be a top priority and, and hopefully you can take that message back to your folks. Thank you. One of your audience members in the Democratic staff referred to you, and I remember, thank you. Thank you all for what you do um, and for putting a presentation like this together. If you could just replicate this maybe in the CBC for a larger group, you've got the choir in the choir stand right now. You don't even have the church full. Because primarily, I think you're talking to TNI staffers and your county and state groups beyond the TNI members, um, that urgency is missing. I don't know what ways in the system. I don't know what our house leadership is doing. But you all have very unique and impactful voices that a Democratic member of TNI may not be as compelling as others. So that would be my suggestion. First, my appreciation for you all focus on this. Um, but we've, we've, Ms. Norton said it, we've got to amp this up. And your presentations were so compelling, um, but they need to be seen and felt beyond the smaller committees of jurisdiction. Thank you. Appreciate that. Other comments, questions? I just want to, uh, before we, we leave this, I uh, want to underscore uh, comments made by two of our local representatives, but the, the, the taxation treatment of interest on municipal bonds is a critical factor in the cost of infrastructure to cities, counties, and states. And uh, I believe we would all be unequivocal in our belief that to change uh, that, that structure, uh, to impose taxation on the interest on municipal bonds would be would have devastating consequences uh, to the ability to continue to, to fund infrastructure. Uh, I'm assuming that that's uh, a widely held and fervently held uh, belief as, as we go forward in thinking about uh, uh, solutions. I would go so far as to say that it's been critical for us to build the wastewater capacity for our community and um, Based with some of the financial challenges we've had, because those are expensive facilities to build, we lost that as a tool that would um, severely limit our ability to do any growth as a community. It's, it's a critical tool for us. I would just uh, add that for whether it be under the state, the county, or the, the city, I would say about maybe half of the municipal bonds are used to build schools. This is how we move our education component forward in this country, this tax exam financing tool. And I would hate to see us, again, from a, being a great country, going back to saying mediocrity is okay for the United States. We are a global leader. We're a world leader. Our education should be superior. No great country has bad infrastructure. President Eisenhower had a brilliant foresight when he became the president of creating the interstate system. There's the reasons for it. It's for domestic uh, national defense. It's for food security. It's for all the reasons that make us great as a country. And it's about time we reinvest in ourselves, the American people. Thank you. David? Yes. One more, one more thing. You know, you all talk about improvements and expansion of wastewater. 
most of us in this room will have systems, both water and wastewater sewer systems, that are 50, 60, 70 years or older. In D.C., I know it's like 100 years old. And so municipal bonds, without that, you're not even talking expansion. You're not even talking growth. You're just talking supply. <coughs> and nobody talks about that because transportation is a big issue now. But let me tell you, without water and without a proper sewer system, the transportation is not going to equity very much. So I'm just saying that, you know, that municipal bond system we use now is very pivotal to continue our survival as municipalities. Well, I want to respect our time limits for this briefing and certainly uh, thank my colleagues and our, our partners uh, at the uh, uh, six organizations that have helped convene this meeting. I appreciate uh, all the work that the staff put into uh, providing us with uh, opportunities for you to hear from what I, I think are uh, three great speakers and, and an adjunct who offered uh, great insights. So thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. I want to uh, give each of our panelists an opportunity to respond to uh, just a final word of advice. Um, at the local and state level, there's a necessity to govern. The budget has to be passed. Uh, the budget has to be balanced. Um, the um, the bonds have to be issued and plans have to be laid out. Most states look at a 10-year highway plan. Municipalities are looking at uh, master plans that, that look far into the future. It's that kind of visioning that allows state and local officials to plan their priorities, to develop the resources, and to fund those priorities. When you have a big partner who, who can't get their act together, it obviously makes governing very difficult. Uh, Senator, you've talked about some of the commonalities and the themes we've heard today, but uh, if you were the pharmacist offering your prescription pad to Congress, uh, what's necessary for states and municipalities to continue to govern and meet their obligations to the same citizens served by uh, the Congress of the United States? Um, what's the wake-up call that needs to be had? You know, I don't know. I would have thought there would have been several wake-up calls out there. Um, but obviously the alarm isn't very loud. Uh, and I don't, you know, I, the other day I was making one of my presentations, I said, I don't want you to think I'm a far-out radical. I mean, this is infrastructure. <coughs> um, the Romans knew that centuries ago, okay? What did, what did they do? They built roads, okay? You, you gotta do that to have commerce. And, but you got, we gotta look at this. I was in business all my life, all right? I always had a three, five, and either a seven or ten year plan. Now it changed every year, but at least I had a plan. I knew I had a, a where, where we're going. Our states are trying to do the same thing. But we, he talked about, Ricky talked about the urgency of this. It is urgent. How, how, how do these 50 state secretaries make a plan when you don't know in four months whether, in fact, just this last week, U.S. Secretary Fox sent out a letter to all the Secretaries of Transportation and said, after May 31, we cannot send you any more money. So whatever you, whatever you don't get here for bills by the May 31st, we aren't paying. See, and we, and we got all those contractors out there building them roads and bridges, and we're writing them out checks, and then we, we, we said, and they're going to say, sorry. So now, how, how would you like to be on that end and start doing five-year plan, seven-year plan? That's what we've come down to. And, and infrastructure is, is vital. That's, that's one of the things we learned a long time ago. If, if you were responsible for the road next to your property and the road next to your property, you'd probably have a, 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 a nice uh, oil road. You might have a cement road. You might have a gravel road. And I might have a dirt road, rut road, OK? How is that going to lend to a system of transportation? It's not, it's not going to. We need to have a system. Little old South Dakota, 55 billion billion dollars worth of goods and services going on out of that state here on road. No parachute. So if I was to say what we I, I really want to know what you want us to do. Because we're out there doing our thing, but we need your partnership. And it's 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 getting difficult. Um, I, I had that question asked a lot when I was pushing this through our body. Why well, do you think the feds are going to do anything? I said, well, we've got to do something here, because with, even without them, we've got to do something. So we've got to act. And we did. 
and as my colleague from Iowa just said, being a Republican uh, from a conservative state that is the lowest tax state in the nation, we did it. It can be done because it is vital. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for me, this is not a NACO thing. It's just my personal thought is that Congress just needs to come to terms that this should not be, in any sense, a partisan issue. This is a practical issue about our economy and our ability to move forward. That's how I see it. Thank you. Boy, politics is a tough business, huh? Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the biggest problem here, you're talking about a wake up call. I mean, we have one of the busiest bridges in our state. Collapsed. Many people died. I mean, if that's not a wake up call, what does it take? So, you know, I guess I'm beyond the point of wake up calls. I would just say is that from a political standpoint, I think this is a political miscalculation, ultimately. This is so critical to every community in America, you know, and I think the consequences of failure to address this are far more severe than whatever might be necessary to be part of a solution. And I, I think, you know, speaking a little bit for my colleague, I think every um, local elected official in the country is willing to speak on behalf of their communities on what is needed. And we're, I think we're ready and willing to give you that level of support. But we need solutions. And, um, you know, we're not seeing them right now. Well, join me in thank you, Dr. Hamilton. Infrastructure Week could not be more appropriately timed with the current extension of MAP 21 set to expire at the end of this month. The Highway Trust Fund, once again, is facing fiscal...